we now have um, Luke Chamandi talking about um, the post, post common envelope binaries. Uh, sorry, planet set post common envelope binaries from, from a different perspective. So, Luke, um, yeah, you're sharing the, the screen now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Roberto. Yes, so, first of all, thanks to the organizers for uh, this nice series of talks. Um, so, our work on this um, uh, was published uh, recently, and uh, it's still very much a work in progress, as you'll see from the talk. So, these are my collaborators here Eric, Jason, and Emily, all based in Rochester in the US. So after one of the previous questions, I just found this from the Vanderberg et al. paper and put this up, uh, uh, just added this to the talk. So this is just uh, the three different models, observational models for the white dwarf. Um, the mass, uh, so, the, so the one they choose is the last one, 50%, 50%, as Felipe had mentioned. Um, so this gives some information, but there is some um, uncertainty based on you know, the modeling, which one, they, which one of these models they choose. So our scenario uh, also involves common envelope, but it's a little bit different than the one that Felipe had mentioned because the, essentially we feel that it's difficult, to, uh, it's difficult to eject the entire envelope with the observed planet. And so um, at least if you don't include extra sources of energy. And so we, we posit that perhaps there was another planet that was engulfed previously, underwent a common envelope, expanded the, the star um, because of the energy uh, uh, it, it, it input, it, 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 it uh, released into the envelope, didn't completely unbind the envelope, but expanded it enough to engulf a second planet. So it kind of goes something like this. You have your two planets orbiting, uh, a red giant or an AGB star. And then the first planet, the inner planet, um, ends up in a common envelope. That can happen because of, you know, tidal effects, uh, reducing the orbital separation. There's a variety of ways that could happen that people have uh, studied. And then what happens is that it migrates in, it in spirals, uh, and it's, in this case, we posit that it's too light to um, eject the envelope completely before it gets tidally disrupted. So it makes it down to a small enough radius, it gets tidally disrupted, and then it accretes onto the core. At least some fraction of that planet material will accrete onto the proto white dwarf core. And that will release a lot of energy because the core is very small. And so there's a lot of potential energy that gets released that will expand uh, the envelope. There will be radiation. There will be possibly some mass ejection. And if it expands it enough, it will engulf that second planet. That second planet will then spiral in, undergo a common envelope of its own and eventually eject the envelope uh, or at least what remains of the envelope binding energy. And then you end up with the system that we see. Now, one very uncertain aspect of this whole scenario is the tidal disruption of the planet and what actually happens after that. Uh, but there have been recent simulations actually by our group. Um, uh, there's a couple of papers out now um, by Gabe Guidarelli from Rochester Institute of Technology and, and collaborators. And this just shows a movie of how a planet, uh, this in this case, it's a 10 Jupiter mass planet, I believe, can get uh, disrupted and begin to form a disk. Uh, the, the time scales are still quite small compared to um, you know, what, what is really needed, but uh, it's a start. And he's also studied uh, how, whether this disk can remain stable for longer periods of time, he finds that it can. So the, our model is extremely simple. Um, we, it's, we just take a few different equations. We solve for a couple of things and it, it's, it's very simple. So first thing we do is we write down the binding energy of the envelope before the first common envelopes uh, happens. And that's the same uh, as the left-hand side of the equation that Felipe had shown. And then we say that the first common envelope releases orbital energy. And we, we can neglect the initial, or, uh, initial orbital energy because it's quite small compared to the final orbital energy. And so that can be checked, but it's quite small. And we multiply by this efficiency factor alpha one. 
and that accounts for some fraction of the binding energy. So you put in some fraction of the binding energy, maybe 80%, maybe 90%. The second common envelope then happens, and same idea, and it, it puts in some fraction beta 2 of the initial binding energy, so the, the binding energy before the first common envelope, with some efficiency alpha 2. And then, of course, uh, since the envelope has to be ejected, we say beta 1 plus beta 2 equals 1. Now you can combine these, you get this expression for beta two in terms of some of these other uh, parameters and an expression for M1, the mass of the original planet that went in the first common envelope. Now I've colored it here so that the red shows you the observed quantities. So the, these are constrained by observations, the mass of the white dwarf, the, uh, the final separation is basically you, something you can get from Kepler's third law. It's just related to the final period, which we know which has been measured. Um, and then the green ones are parameters that in our original paper, we, we kind of, uh, they were somewhat free to adjust, but uh, that they can be constrained much better if you use stellar evolution models. And now we've started using MESA to constrain them. And so the green ones are the ones that we've now constrained using MESA models. And the blue ones are still parameters. M2, however, has an upper limit uh, of, by Vanderberg of about 14. Uh, Jupiter masses. So you take, and I'm going to use those colors throughout the talk. So uh, looking at that first equation for beta 2, you find that uh, the, the greater the, uh, the, the, the greater the mass of the star and the more distended it is, uh, or sorry, the, the less distended it is, so the smaller the radius, uh, the smaller beta 2 will be. So it's basically related to, it's just how, how easy it is for the observed planet to unbind uh, what remains of the envelope. So if it's small, it's going to be harder to unbind. Um, for M1, the mass of the first planet, uh, there's really two possibilities for the final separation. One, well, I shouldn't say two possibilities, but we considered uh, two extreme scenarios. One where it all of the material, all of the disrupted planet accretes right onto the surface of the white dwarf. Then you release the most energy. So that AF1, the final separation is equal to the white dwarf radius. A more conservative estimate is that you disrupt and then you stop releasing any energy. You don't accrete. So the, the truth probably lies somewhere in between. And you could estimate that disruption radius. Um, since beta 2 tends to be much less than one, you can simplify this formula and you get these two possibilities depending on whether you look at case, you're looking at case one or case two. And so again, uh, the more compact the envelope and the star, uh, the greater mass for that first planet that you need to unbind beta one uh, fraction of the envelope binding energy. Now, uh, Felipe talked a lot about the core mass and how that affects the models. So we actually now consider three different possibilities. So the first possibility is that the, the, white, the core mass is equal to the white dwarf mass that's been observed by Van der Berg of 0.52 solar masses, roughly. And that's this pink region. If that's the case, then the star uh, had to be an AGB at the time of the first common envelope, because um, the RGB, if you look at these, these curves, this just shows different zero age main sequence masses of the stars and how they evolve uh, over time. So the core mass keeps increasing. Now, if you take, for example, the 2.2 uh, Zam star, uh, on the RGB, it gets to this radius, it gets larger on the AGB. So by this time, you know, if the, it's quite possible that the common envelope wouldn't have happened here because the radius wasn't high enough, but it does happen on the AGB. And so that's one possibility. But if you take like a one solar mass star, that's not going to happen because it was actually probably larger on the RGB than on the AGB. So it's not going to, if the core mass is really 0.52, uh, there's, it sets a, uh, a range of, of possible ZAMS masses. And it, that range is about 2 to 2.7. However, it's possible there was a, you know, a range of uncertainty in that measurement. So it's possible that it happened on the RGB tip somewhere. Uh, this is sort of the lower bound of the uncertainty. And that would be about, and that uh, sets limit of about one to 1.6 solar masses. 
or it could have happened um, as Felipe's model fa favors uh, uh, at, at, during the pulsating phase of the AGB, and then the the mass would Zam's mass would have been somewhere between two and two point eight. Um, right. So, and then we, there's certain parameters associated with these MESA models, but it's not very sensitive to those. So this is the one of the key results is that we put these numbers in. We look first at the AGB case, or 0.518 um, solar mass white dwarf. We restrict to less than 14 solar masses for the mass of the planet, the observed planet, as in Vandenberg. Um, and this is what we find. So beta 2 is a like versus the mass of the, of the observed planet for various uh, MESA models. So these parameters are set by MESA, including lambda. Lambda includes the thermal energy and the potential energy. It does not include, not, does not try to include any extra energy sources like recombination. However, we've shown alpha uh, values from 0.25 to five. So the ones that are greater than one or even equal to one must include extra energy sources because efficiency will always be less than one uh, if you're converting orbital energy to, uh, to binding energy. And so what we find for, for beta, let me just show this first. So for beta two, we find values, uh, if it's 0.25, the values are quite low. So in terms of the fraction of the initial binding energy before common envelope one, that planet two actually um, puts in, it's actually quite small if you think that alpha is uh, 0.25, which is sort of what's been estimated in population synthesis studies. So we're talking less than 1%. If, you, if there are other sources of energy, then beta can be higher. Now we, we feel that, I feel a bit uncomfortable if beta is too small, because it seems like, okay, well, why do you even bother with planet two when planet one can unbind almost everything? Why, is, why, would, planet, why would it uh, be such that planet one would unbind 99 point whatever percent, and then planet two just comes in and unbinds this tiny amount that's left over. So that's something that we're still thinking about. But this is what we get. And then for the mass of planet one that you need, again, it depends on what you assume about where the final separation lies. If it accretes of all that material of the disrupted planet accretes right onto the white dwarf, you get out more energy and you need a smaller mass. If it uh, disrupts and then doesn't accrete, then you get less energy and you need a bigger mass. So there's a range, but, uh, and, and it also depends on alpha that you assume, because if the second planet unbinds more, then your first planet doesn't need to unbind as much. Um, so you can see in the thick lines is the case where uh, it accretes onto the core, thin lines it doesn't. You get, uh, for the most favorable scenarios where you have alpha really large, you can get uh, a Jupiter mass planet can do the whole, the whole job pretty much. But if you want alpha 0.25, then you require kind of like a 10, at least a 10 Jupiter mass uh, planet uh, and probably more like a, a small brown dwarf. Now the second part is the expansion. You don't only need to eject the envelope, but you need to expand it or, or, or beta one, the fra fraction beta one of the envelope, but you need to expand it enough so that it, um, it engulfs planet two. And so <clears throat> to try to get an estimate of the expansion, we use energy conservation. It's a very simple model. It basically assumes hydrostatic equilibrium before and after. Um, and so we equate the energy input or the, the initial energy um, after, after you've inputted the energy from common envelope one to the final energy after the envelope has expanded, uh, plus whatever energy goes into ejected material. And this gives you some kind of a, a result for the, the radius, the final radius. We call that R2 max. Max because this neglects cooling, and so your envelope can keep expanding, but in, in fact, you'll lose energy by cooling. And so you could also uh, look at that regime where if you lost energy by cooling, now you can uh, equate the energy injection rate with the energy loss rate from both radiation and uh, ejected material. And then you can, solve both of these equations and take the minimum because 
you know, if the cooling is, is inefficient, it will expand to that maximum radius. If not, it will stop when the two, when the injection rate and cooling rate balance or loss rate balance. So we take the minimum and we're usually, we find usually we're in the regime where cooling is important. And let's just for simplicity, consider the case where you have zero ejection and you end up with this formula. And this gives you the ratio of the, the final divided by the initial radius. Um, you have some adjustable parameters left that were not present in, you know, when we were in the other equations for beta two and M one, which are the final temperature and the injection time, how long the common envelope one lasts essentially. Uh, T2 is, you don't have as much freedom as you might think because when you look at stellar evolution models, a large change in radius usually leads to only a very small change in the temperature. So to be conservative, I'm going to take T2 equals T1, although it would be a little bit smaller than T1. Uh, and the injection time is not obvious what that would be. But just one thing that's worth mentioning is that if you compare it to what we had for beta two, beta two, we wanted a more distended, less compact star to uh, be able to unbind more easily for planet two. Uh, but for this one, it's the opposite effect, because if you have that more distended star, then it's going to radiate more. And so you kind of have opposite requirements. You can see that what's in the numerator, you know, in one is in the denominator of the other, et cetera. So um, it's difficult to make, to both unbind the envelope with planet two and, or planet one, and, and to also make it expand a lot. So that's one of the, uh, one of the constraints we're facing. So one thing is we have to estimate the injection time. We do that using the Eddington, the Eddington rate. Uh, we estimate the mass accretion rate to be about uh, two, three times 10 to the minus five solar mass per year. And that leads to an injection time of about one to a hundred years. Typically a hundred years is what we use in the examples. So what we get in this AGB case for the 0.52 solar mass core is that it is possible to get uh, it's quite a bit of expansion. Your ejected mass cannot be too high, um, but we're talking about you know two solar mass stars here, and uh, based you know using various uh, parameter values, you can get uh, expansions of order factor of two uh, fairly fairly easily, fairly naturally, and um, that that is pro that could be sufficient for engulfing another planet. Uh, now, after we first wrote the paper, we, you know, we submitted and then we realized uh, someone, uh, Noam Soker, brought to our attention that the, these papers by Cease and Livio in 1999, which are quite interesting, and they take detailed 1D models and they evolve, they, uh, they have some accretion rate onto the core from a brown dwarf, uh, you know, uh, from a brown dwarf being disrupted and accreting. And uh, they explore all in, de in a detailed way all, all of what happens uh, to the star. And they find that it does expand. So they have two papers, but this is the AGB one. They also look at RGBs. They find that it does expand uh, by a factor of a few, and then it cools. Um, and their accret the accretion rates they get, uh, ours is, our estimate is somewhere in between. So um, more models are needed, more detailed 1D models are needed, but. Uh, it compares reasonably well with this. They also find that nuclear energy generation can play a role and may increase the expansion in some cases. And the time scales for expansion are of order 100 years, or they're sometimes of order 1,000 years, depending on the model they, they assume. So to summarize, these are our results. Um, for M1, for this AGB case, we need, uh, for to, if you have a small alpha, you need uh, planet, the initial planet mass, M1, uh, greater than 10 Jupiter masses. You need beta 2 less than half a percent. The R2 over R1, the expansion factor, uh, is going to be less than about 3, and that translates into an expansion of about 230 solar radii. And these are the assumptions of the models here. That age requirement that Felipe mentioned makes us require uh, the ZAMS mass to be greater than about 1.5. So I've put that in here as well. If we assume that we're on the RGB tip, which would mean that the, the white dwarf mass is at the lower end, near the lower end of the estimate by Vanderberg, 
then you could use a 1.6 solar mass star and the values that we get are slightly more favorable for unbinding, but slightly less favorable for expansion. And very similar numbers if you assume it's on the pulsating AGB at the upper end of the mass range. Okay, so to summarize, uh, planet one supplies most of the envelope in our uh, binding energy in our scenario, the fraction beta one. It causes an expansion resulting in the engulfment of planet two. Planet two then unbinds what remains of the envelope, a fraction beta two, which is one minus beta one of the original envelope binding energy. Our model can work for the full uncertainty range of core mass in, Vanderberg, in the Vanderberg paper. Generally, we require that the previous planets had a combined mass, and I say previous, you know, combined because it could be there were more than one, and this happened a couple of different times, uh, greater than one Jupiter mass, but the model does work better if we're talking about planets or, or brown dwarfs of greater than 10, um, a planet of, or brown dwarf greater than 10 Jupiter masses. Is beta two uncomfortably small? Uh, if we don't include extra energy sources, that's something we're still thinking about. But the, an expansion by a factor of two seems natural, naturally attainable. Uh, now, Felipe uh, gave a nice talk just now, and their model requires alpha lambda greater or equal to about four, which in turn requires extra sources of energy, i.e. recombination energy, as he talked about as well as a core mass of greater than about 0.57 solar masses, whereas that's, that value is right at the upper end of the Vanderberg range. However, Alonzo, in that paper he mentioned by Alonzo, that preprint, does estimate a larger white dwarf mass. So it still remains to be determined what the white dwarf mass exactly is. If we can pin that down, it will help us to pin down uh, to constrain the models. So I'd say that our results do not contradict those of Felipe and group uh, because we have not yet studied cases with those high values of MCOR, but we can confirm that beta two equal one is not obtained easily. So it's hard for just that planet to unbind the whole envelope. You need kind of special parameters. We actually have the opposite concern that beta two is a bit too small, that we don't unbind enough of the envelope with planet two. A possible remedy could be that planet two is actually just a passive component and contributes negligibly to negligibly to envelope ejection. The time scales may work to allow both common envelopes to happen, uh, to overlap. Uh, and then you would need a mechanism for, planet, for the planet two in spiral to be halted by the activity from common envelope one. So there'd be some kind of wind from the center that would halt the in spiral and fix it there uh, until the envelope blows away. And then we observe it many gig years later, but this is work in progress. So how am I doing for time? Should I stop or should I finish the last two slides? Yeah, I think you have still a couple of minutes. Okay. So in terms of extra energy sources, the first possibility is recombination energy of ionized, you know, recombination of ionized gas. Uh, but this is a latent energy source. It does not contribute to the initial binding energy. The questions are what fraction is released inside the bound envelope gas, the bound envelope gas, because if it's released when it's already unbound, that won't contribute. But then also what fraction of that which is released is actually used to unbind the envelope. So simulations find that released recombination energy can assist on binding, but they neglect radiative losses that are probably important. So I recommend these papers uh, that, that study simulations that include uh, recombination energy. And recombination energy may not be necessary to explain observed properties of white dwarf and main sequence binary populations, according to this paper by Kojo Kuru, 2017, who finds that uh, although it does help, it, it has a very minor effect. But uh, Monica Zorotovich has uh, other papers, and uh, I think she's here. You can chat with her about, about those, which maybe suggests that you do need recombination energy. Now, uh, another possibility is fusion of accreted material. So this was looked at by in those Cease and Livio papers, and we have not really considered it. It's mentioned in a footnote in our paper, but uh, if you were to release a fraction F of the rest energy of the accreted matter, um, you, could, uh, you could release as much energy, the fusion can provide as much energy as accretion if this ratio uh, is one, or ten, one to 10%, perhaps. So we're talking uh, 
you know, fusion energy could actually uh, be as important as accretion energy. And so it, it should be looked at. This would lower the minimum value of M1 and possibly also reduce the injection time of energy. Uh, nuclear fusion during the helium flash has recently been suggested to explain this system. So the same idea, you expand the star and get a common, uh, a common envelope with the observed planet, but uh, it's not done by a previous planet that went in and experienced a common envelope, but it's done by the helium flash. So this is a new preprint. And then, as I mentioned, Cease and Livio actually find that nuclear burning uh, is affected. Fusion energy is not readily available in a single CE scenario. So finally, the conclusions, successive, and by successive, I mean separated by less than a thousand years or so, common envelope events involving multiple planets or brown dwarfs may be common. It is a viable scenario to explain this system, but we need planet one to be fairly massive, more massive, I should say, than what we mentioned in our paper when, we had, when the parameters were not constrained by MESA. Uh, be fairly massive, and we need this observed planet itself to unbind only a very small part of the envelope uh, in terms of the binding energy, in terms of the initial binding energy. So more work is needed, including models with simultaneous um, CE1 and CE2, nuclear energy release during accretion of planet one, detailed 1D and 3D models, very challenging to do 3D models of common envelope with planets, uh, but we've started, and application to other systems like these two that I found in the literature. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Luke. Um, do we have any questions? No questions yet. Maybe it's not this lighting. You can raise your hand and ask the question out loud if you want. Okay, there is a question from Noam Soka. Hi, you. Uh, very nice talk. I have a question about the energy that you release with planet one. If, if you accrete hydrogen to the burning hydrogen shell on the core, you release more nuclear energy. But if the planet is destroyed uh, at about one solar radii, far from the burning hydrogen, you actually take energy because you need now to heat the material of the tidally destroyed planet. Did, did you take that into account? If you destroy planet one, actually you need to spread now the material and you add binding energy to the new envelope that now includes the first planet that you just destroyed. Mm. Uh, no, we didn't take that into account. I, I was aware of that possibility and I, I think I, I estimated it to be a small effect. Um, I, I think the planet, the planet mass is just very small compared to the envelope mass. Uh, even though you're deep down, I don't think it would be, make a very significant contribution to the binding energy. Uh, I could but be wrong about that. But. You, you, you reverse the process. You take planet outside, it goes all the way in. Now that you evaporate it, it, it is a gas that you need to uplift to distribute in the envelope. And you don't need the same amount of energy, uh, but you need some energy. As well, if, if you need several hundred years until the second planet enters, then the stellar luminosity will be higher because of energy deposition. So with the stellar luminosity, you might also lose some of the energy that you gained by the first planet. So, I mean, the first planet, when it disrupts, uh, we find, it, we, we assume in our, at least in our most uh, optimistic model that all of that material accretes onto the white dwarf. So it doesn't have to be mixed into the envelope at all. Um, if it doesn't accrete, then some of it will be mixed, but some of it will also accrete. So it will be something in between. Um, we, it's possible that nuclear energy can go the other way. Like you say, it could be that uh, the accretion of, of disrupted planet material actually affects uh, nuclear fusion in the opposite way, that it re somehow reduces the rate of 
uh, the energy uh, rate, rate of energy released by nuclear fusion. I mean, Cease and Livio uh, studied uh, a few different scenarios and they found that in some case, in some cases, the accretion actually reduces the, the luminosity from fusion, I believe. Other cases, it increases it. So it's complicated because obviously, uh, you know, when you're looking at the various shells uh, where helium, helium burning is happening, uh, sorry, hydrogen burn is, is happening, or where helium burn, burning is happening, it, it, gets, uh, it gets complicated. So we have to look at that in more detail. Um, we're just, for now, we're just saying that fusion could make a difference. And most naturally, you would expect fusion to make it easier to unbind the envelope. If you have accretion, you have more fusion you have un more unbinding, but it, it still needs to be looked at. I can't really say for one way or the other, only that it's, it's something that needs to be included in the models. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is there any other question? Okay, I think if there are no other questions, we can uh, create um, the breakout rooms and um, as we discussed before, we create just one breakout room for uh, Luke and uh, Felipe, uh, where you can discuss with them about their, um, their talks. And so thank you again for your presentations. And I will stop now recording. <laughs>